Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from TRT World Studios here in Istanbul. Why do we need to safeguard Turkey's cultural inheritance? Today, we'll talk to a professor and find out why Anatolian heritage is worth investing in. We'll also tell you all about the latest addition to the X-Men franchise, Dark Phoenix. And beware of the rabbit hole, as the Hungarian artist you're going to meet later might take you down one. But first... The Alberto Giacometti Effect. We'll look at an exhibition juxtaposing works by several of the acclaimed sculptor's favorite artists, alongside his own stylized and fragile looking pieces. I think unconsciously I kind of hope that my work will be a kind of bridge. You know, we tend to fear what things that we don't understand. That's renowned photographer Peter Sanders. While he was here in Istanbul, I got a chance to speak with him about his latest exhibition, as well as what it was like for him to photograph everything from rock and roll icons to far-flung religious communities over the past 50 years. Peter, welcome to Showcase. Thank you. Tell us about your new exhibition, An Odyssey of Peace, Searching for Light. Um, this, this came out of a kind of process of me kind of looking back at my life and trying to make sense of it. And obviously the key to it is all the pictures that I've kind of taken. So I had this idea to do something that made sense to me and I wasn't sure whether it would make sense to other people. And we looked at possibly about doing it in Dubai, but I think Dubai just wasn't ready for it. I, the mixture of music and Islamic world was just, that, so we did it separately. We did the music and then we did a thing on the Islamic. Uh, but, so I was interested when uh, Turkey approached me and said they wanted to do a retrospective. And I said, that's great, I've been wanting to do that. So I just really got into it spent a lot of time on working on the concept and the images and the kind of uh, commentary which kind of links all the pictures together. That was really the idea. You mentioned music. You started your career in the 60s taking photographs of rock and roll icons. Yes. Which one was the most iconic to you? Uh, well, Bob Dylan was obviously very iconic. You know, he was kind of voice of my generation. He, you know, speaking out against wars and, and kind of what was happening to the world at that time. And of course the Beatles were very iconic at that time, but they were already big, so I couldn't, I never got to photograph them. But, you know, I got to photograph Henrix, and that's the last concert he did before he passed away. And so I, I was quite lucky to document most of the people around at that time. Then you started on your journey to document yes. the Islamic world, um, architecture and its people. What, what, put, what took you on that path? It actually was, the, there's a kind of section which in, is in between that, which is what I call the search. So it, I went to India kind of really to look for a kind of spiritual path. And I was looking at all the different religions. I looked at Hinduism and Buddhism. And I read a little bit about Islam at that time, not a huge amount. So that process was really me looking for something. So th that section in this exhibition is called like the search. And then kind of Islam came on the horizon. And I always tell people at that time, not that much was known about Islam. There was no radicalization, so it wasn't in the headlines. It was, a, it was an easy, what I call a leap of faith to make. You know, I think now someone at the same kind of position as me might find it quite a challenging, uh, you know, choice to make. But anyway, it was easy for me. It was, as I said, a leap of faith. And I did, then, of course, I just started traveling around. Actually, the first thing I did after going to Morocco, I went and did Hajj, you know, and uh, got permission to photograph the Hajj. It took me two weeks going from office to office. Finally, somebody with enough courage said, okay, I'll give you permission to photograph it. So I photographed the Hajj in 1971, which was quite a rare thing. 50 years of work, more than 500,000 images. Yeah. This is the impossible question. If you have half a million photos or, or images, which is the most precious to you? You know, someone said who's much wiser than me, the photo I'm going to take tomorrow, because a bit of this is just like looking back, it's past now. And I'm always interested in what, what am I going to, how am I going to use my creative uh, energy that 
God gave me, what am I going to apply it to next? And because I've taken so many pictures, I'm more interested now, what do we do with images? You know, there's a, there's a figure of four billion images are uploaded every day on the internet. You know, we're being now bombarded with images. It's almost like it's, it's a language in itself that young people use. And we need to know how to use it. We need, need to know how to speak it. And we need, if you're a photographer, you need to be able to take images that have an impact. What's, what's your advice for, for young photographers getting their start in, today? I always say take masses of pictures and be your worst critic because you, as the creator of that image, know everything that's wrong with it, more than anyone else looking at it. And you know how you can improve on it and, and perfect it as much as a human being can. So it's just, a, it's a process. You know, you are a process in doing it and you learn by doing it. You were documenting Chinese Muslims 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Um, and now we hear about the, the re-education camps that some of them yeah. are going through. When you hear about that, um, what do you make of it because of you, your intimate knowledge of the community? Yeah, it's, it's pity because I've always, I've always been interested in Chinese Muslims because they are Muslim, but they're also very Chinese. And I found that like a really interesting example of pure integration. They haven't become something else. They are still Chinese, but they're also Muslims. I don't totally understand the situation with Western China, there has been a, a kind of struggle been going on there for a long time. So they've always wanted autonomy. So, but I did have the opportunity to travel in there uh, in, I think, 2003. And I, you know, I got some great pictures. There's really amazing mosques and things. It was really beautiful. That's another project that I hope to produce a book because uh, I have really a lot of pictures from that. Yeah, I've heard about this. It's, it's really sad, you know, and I hope it gets kind of come to some kind of understanding. You know. You've taken photographs in Turkey as well. What's your lasting memory of this country? I came the first time here in 1978, so it was a very different, different place, and I've been coming here quite regularly. We do, we do a photographic workshop in various locations around the world, and the one we do in Turkey is always really a lot of fun, and the students get a lot of you know, joy from seeing all these great mosques and sites, historical places. It has an incredible atmosphere which people pick up on, yeah. It's a, Turkey's a great place for photography. We see Islamophobia sweeping through many parts of the globe. What's the message you want your work to convey about Islam? Yeah, I think unconsciously I kind of hope that my work will be a kind of bridge. You know, we tend to fear what things that we don't understand. You know, they say if you're scared of spiders, go and pick up a spider and hold it in your hand, you know. And people need to understand that Muslims, generally Muslims, are not the enemy there. You know, we, I, I wrote in my book that we as human race, we are the problem. We're also the solution and we're also a work in progress. And we need to be together and we need to work together as, a, as, a, as one giant family, as difficult as that sounds and how Maybe some people think that's a fantasy, but that's the reality. We need to know one another. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks. For our next story, we're going to Madrid to explore an exhibition displaying two completely different types of art together in an unlikely harmony. The Prado Museum is contrasting different mediums and approaches to art by showing the powerful works of prominent 16th and 17th century artists, paired with the bleak drawings and sculptures of Alberto Giacometti. His sculptures are neither colourful nor realistic. When you look at them closely, you feel something gloomy and heavy. So, at first thought, putting Alberto Giacometti's works alongside the likes of Tintoretto or Velázquez may sound bizarre. However, through this exhibition, Spain's Prado Museum wants to highlight the unique way Giacometti was inspired by some of the biggest names in the European art. Giacometti began his career by copying. 
and he continued his whole life copying. But his copies are made in the Giacometti way. He copied Durero, he copied Tintoretto and Velázquez. This exhibition confirms the idea that great art is timeless and that in the end, Giacometti is an absolutely classical artist. Throughout his life, his obsession was the human figure and the space created around it. And what's being done in the gallery makes his art look one with the paintings. In an odd way, the elongated and nervous-looking human figures of Giacometti resemble the characters from the paintings next to them, although in a much darker way. Some art historians say that world wars and the alienation among humanity that occurred right after those wars affected Giacometti's works. I believe that the great success of the exhibition is not to confine the artist to one single exhibition space. That is, his works are not in room A nor in room B of the Prado Museum, but they are distributed in some of the most emblematic museum spaces, the ones with more significance and together with works of artists for whom Giacometti manifested extraordinary admiration, such as Tintoretto, El Greco or Velázquez. Perhaps Giacometti's rather lonely sculptures have finally found their ultimate place in Spain. Or maybe it's just another excuse to find beauty in art that is actually centuries and worlds apart. Still to come on Showcase, Dark Phoenix Rising. You're my family, Jean. Stop, no matter what. Stop, stop, stop! Get ready to be blown away as the X-Men undertake their final outing under the 20th century Fox banner. Putting heritage first as Turkey hosts a fair where experts come together to grow the country's tourism footprint. Creating illusions using just paint and light, Borgi Fabian's creations transport spectators straight into fantasy worlds. The latest chapter of the idolized superhero X-Men saga is about to be unleashed on fans. 20th century Fox turned X-Men into one of the most daring and loved comic book adaptation franchises ever, ruling fans' hearts as well as the box office for almost 20 years. Dark Phoenix will now mark the last Fox-produced outing, with Disney having acquired the film properties. When Hollywood studio 20th Century Fox first brought to the silver screen the comic book adaptation of X-Men, a group of powerful mutants on a mission to protect humankind, the company changed the course of movie going forever by ushering in the age of superhero films. You're my family, James. Stop. No matter what. Stop. 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 Now, almost 20 years later, the X franchise is still going strong. This final entry in the series sees fan favorite character Jean Grey struggle against the Dark Phoenix Force, which hosts itself in the X Men leader's mind after she's hit in space by a solar flare. The motion picture is based on a best selling storyline from the X books and is lauded for its dramatic quality. Jean and what's happening to her, and it splits some of the X Men up. You know, some people think that she's way too dangerous and they must stop her. And then others think that, you know, they can, there's still a chance to save her. So it really becomes this, you know, really interesting, you know, tense kind of um, uh, complicated character dynamic between everyone. What well, they don't understand, they fear. And it looks like with the last edition of their franchise, 20th Century Fox has also caught up with the recent trend of giving women superheroes the lead by focusing on the drama of Marvel girl Jean Grey. 
portraying all of the characters, male and female, but they had focused, the, the main characters were male. Wolverine, Professor Xavier, um, Magneto, that was true in the original series. And I felt like it was time for those strong females to take the lead. She's still our friend. Dark Phoenix may mark the last X-Men movie for 20th Century Fox, but fear not. Our superhero young mutants, acquired by Walt Disney Studios, are joining the company's multi-million franchise, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for further exciting adventures. Brainstorming how to preserve the country's heritage as well as grow it. This is what the fourth edition of Heritage Istanbul Fair is setting out to accomplish as the who's who of the city gather under one roof. The key focus of this three-day event is to bring together sector professionals from Turkey and abroad, archaeologists, experts from museums, government officials, private businessmen and publishers, just about anybody who has a vested interest in the country's welfare will gather from April the 11th when Heritage Istanbul kicks off. The goal of this fair is the preservation of Turkey's heritage, but also growing it in the future. Now to tell us about why preserving Anatolian cultural heritage is crucial, we've got an expert in. Mehmet Özdoğan is Professor Emeritus in Archaeology. Hi Mehmet, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for the invitation. So, Turkey is obviously at a, at a crossroads, at a very significant location geographically, and also it has a very long history. But despite that, when we look at UNESCO World Heritage List, there are only 19 assets from Turkey in comparison to 49 from Italy and 45 from China, for example. Why is that? Don't you think Turkey should have more? Well, thank you for asking this question. It's, uh, the problem is that Turkey was, Turkey's interest in getting into World Heritage List started quite late. In the earlier years, Turkey didn't take it very serious and didn't understand what was necessary to be in that list. But in this last 15 or 20 years, Turkey started getting interest, but it didn't take a lot of time, long period of time, to prepare the files for being in the list. So it's a long process, but now in the last few years, Turkey has been very successful in, uh, in, promote, in, the list, in getting into list new sites. And each year now, there's a, uh, Turkey is preparing new dossiers and we hope in the future there will be more sites, but it's a long process and it also needs a long, uh, some kind of a concern where how to protect the sites and uh, how to manage it. And so it's, it's not only getting into a list, then there's also, there's also sustainability mm -hmm. has to be with it. And we mentioned that Anatolia is quite rich when it comes to cultural heritage, but you are the expert. Can you please tell me why Anatolia is so important historically? The point with Anatolia is, <clears throat> that it's uh, one of the most important turning points of cu cultural history, most critical uh, points of uh, no return, it taking place in this area. Beginning of sedentary life, beginning of agriculture, beginning of food production, and these kind of uh, very important uh, events which, have, which are consequential to later civilizations took place in this geography. That is why Anatolia is very crucially important for understanding what had happened in the cultural history. It, uh, our global uh, civilization is based on what had happened in Anatolia. And do you think it's taken care of well? How, how is Turkey doing when it comes to cultural heritage preservation? Archaeology is a kind of a release of the past, the archives of the past. They are not only for the present, but they are also for the future and for the entire humanity. So, uh, and to get this information out of the archaeological site, you need excavations. Then when you, once you excavate, you need managing, and then you have to promote it to the general public. So it's all very complicated, but I think we are doing not too bad. And most, especially during the last few years, heritage management is a new, is a concept which also get, uh, Turkey is not doing too bad in it, but we can, we should do better. It How about funding, for example? Funding, we are doing not too bad. We are now, because in, in most of the Western countries, now funding is getting low. And in, in Turkey, for, especially for excavations, we are not too, I think we are in a good position, I would say. Mm -hmm. But managing and, and, and the organization's management is another problem. That is not very, well, 
we still have to go. Uh, uh, we still have to go a long way in that management, but yeah. uh, in, we are not too bad, I think. Okay, I understand. And also, there is the plundered, plundered artifacts issue. I mean, there are at least one hundred fifty thousand treasures kept in leading Western museums, such as Victoria and Albert or like Louvre in Paris. What should we do about this? Well, I think there are two things. One of them is a part of the history of archaeology, something which had been uh, taken out in the 18th century or 19th century. is not plunder. It's a part of the archaeological history. That's how the archaeology began, actually. It's, it's dragging. But what's happening in the later than when Turkey started ha having its legislations, uh, then that is plundering. But I think more important is to stop plundering, present-day plundering, and destruction of sites is more important. Of course, uh, trying to get uh, objects back from uh, repatriated objects is a kind of a, is a kind of uh, stopping the, the concept of illegal trafficking of ar ar artifacts, which is very bad. But uh, in the past, it's a part of history. But at the present, it's very it's, it's critical importance. So we should stop being sites being plundered nowadays. I okay. think it's more important and to protect the heritage now we have. And then uh, anything which is illegally trafficked, that should be, which Turkey should make all the pressure abroad to take it back, because it's, it's an example. And do you think lobbying would work? I oh, mean, yes, what, what, what is the importance of lobbying in this? Lobbying is, lobbying is that it, it will, it will uh, dis discourage antiquated dealers, because there's a big market. The market wants a guarantee. So if Turkey is lobbying and if, say, if when, when a Turkey is able to repatriate an artifact, then it's, it's a kind of a threat to the antiquated dealers. Mm -hmm. And extra legislation, do you think that is also needed? No, Turkish legislation is very good. Turkish legislation in, prote in, uh, in, in protection of archaeological heritage is in quite In general, good. it's very good. It's very exactly. good. Uh, it's not always well implemented, but it's very good. So we don't need a new legislation. We just need how it's managed and how it's implemented. Okay, let's talk about Heritage Istanbul. What are you aiming with that? Uh, as we just spoke about it, Turkish heritage is very important. But heritage is not important just for tourism. Heritage is not important just for science. It's not only a touristic asset. Heritage is a very complex uh, entity. It, it, it involves a, a number of uh, shareholders, scientists, the bureaucracy, uh, future, the people who live with the heritage and tourism and many other things. So in the, uh, and it is a new way of looking at the past and, the, uh, the, and, and to protect the past for the future. The importance so. of cultural heritage is definitely rising as uh, the political climate is changing in the world. Thank you so much, Professor Mehmet Özdan, for this. Thank you for asking this question. Thank you. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we leave you today, we want to introduce you to an artist that transforms ordinary spaces into dazzling cosmic worlds, teeming with spiral galaxies, glittering stars and clouds of dust and gas. But only when you turn off the lights. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.